you, this this graffiti's getting really bad. I saw one down at 23rd Street that says, Gore Vidal is a white liberal. I mean, you know, I mean, you that's getting sick. I mean, you know, that's sick, 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 sick. I mean, you know where the Archie, you know where the Archie Bunker would say it. You know, old Archie would say, that's a sick thing. Oh, that's sick. Oh, it makes me sick to my stomach. You hear that? My stomach. Way down where the Elka says, so don't reach. You know, uh, I mean, oh, everything. You know, it's just that way. Like uh, like the other day, I'm walking along through this dime store, and I, I happen to be hooked on going to dime stores, you know, five and dimes. And they had this uh, working astrologer in there. You know, they, they not only sell uh, plumber's helpers and... Uh, and uh, picture frames made out of Brillo pads and all that groovy stuff you can get in the dime store. Now, yes, they had an astrologer working in there. But it was, an, it was the new style astrologer. It was a, an astrologer that computes things by, uh, by using a computer. Of course, the old-fashioned astrologer sat around and had one of these pointed hats, you know, with the moons and all that stuff and used powdered bats, wings, and jazz. But the, the new one had this fantastic uh, computer and the computer was was beautiful. It was it was it was you know what flocking is? You know what is it flocking? Flocking has nothing to do with birds. And the term flocking I'm using has nothing to do with obscenity. This is a you know a, uh, it's a bad scene. But he he uh, no it was flocked. You know it was had purple fur on it. See, it was kind of nice. It had all these little green eyes going away, and it had computer digits. You know go boop 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 and seven eight nine boop 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 and I, I was standing over there, and I enjoyed the whole thing, see? So this guy's giving me the pitch. He says, come on over. He said, uh, uh, who knows what mystery lies in the stars? Your whole future, your whole life may be going down the drain because you do not realize what the stars who control your every moment have had to say about your entire future, and you have been unaware of it. I said, well, that, I've tried everything else. You know, I've tried agents. I've tried the whole bit, see? So I walk over to the guy, and I says, how much is it? And he says, well, it depends on whether you want the full, uh, the full astrological, totally computer, computed the entire, uh, future, or if you want just, uh, what we call a, a quickie. He said, a quickie. He says, a lot of people come in here after their lunch hour for a quickie, you know. And, oh, maybe every couple of years they'll get the, the whole full treatment, see. So I says, well, how about a quickie? He says, all right, a quickie. Okay, he said, here, fill out the card. Well, of course, the card says, what's your name? Uh, what moon you were born under, what star, what ding dong you were born under, you know, what phase of the universe or whatever, all that jazz. See, so I was kind of stumped on that because my mother never really told me what the phase of the moon was when I was born into that. So I faked it, you know, I wrote, you know, a few things down and I put my name and all that. And he says, all right, thank you. That'll be two dollars and a half. All right. And now we pass the card on to the great eternal calculator of the universe. Yes, it's computer astro. And he shoves the card into the slot and... Boop, 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 it was all over in about 38 seconds. I mean, that damn thing could figure out my whole life in 38 milliseconds. Now it came in a printed readout form, which, you know, nobody can argue with printed readout. I mean, you know what printed readout is. That's those funny little numbers, you know, that look like... The, the little sixes on the bottom look like eights that somebody's erased the top of and... And, uh, you know, that's bad news. So it came out in the computer readout, and he hands it to me. He says, oh, here it is. Here's your, here's your readout. And all it said was, get rid of that first name. You're sunk unless you get rid of that first name. That J kills you. What the hell is this? I mean, any computer with a name like that one had was made in Sweden. It's got no right to talk about anybody else's name, you know? And so I, I go walking out two dollars and a half lighter... I go walking out into the street there, and the stars were shining through the Jersey smog above me. Of course, they're controlling my every moment, every, my every instant, and probably even controlling Dear Abby. I mean, everybody, see? So I get out there, and I look at that thing, and I thought, well, maybe they're right. That name, J-E-A-N, has confused a lot of people. It is not feminine. It is only feminine to those who do not know anything about French. And, of course, that includes... Most of you clods, Didimo, uh, to we who speak, uh, you know, to we who parlez vous Francaise, uh, you can you can certainly you know there's a, there's a, it never occurred to us that the name Jean is a is a feminine name and it is not. 
So I thought, well, maybe they're right. Here, just the other day, I was invited to the Upper Midwestern Writer Conference. It's a very exciting, oh, very official writers conference to spend two weeks communing with the muse and uh, discussing writing with students that come from all parts of the globe to discuss writing with writers, except for one thing. The opening part of the letter said, uh, Dear Miss Shepard, we have been interested in your fantastic humor work. You're one of the few lady writers who has achieved any degree of status in the humor field. I, you know, you should have seen the letter I wrote back. You know what I did? I took this letter, see, I wrote back to him. And, and, uh, I took, I, I, I got a real, you know, real cheap piece of writing paper. You know, the kind that you get in these tablets with the blue lines that has an Indian on the cover on the outside. You know, that real cheap paper, see. And I wrote it in a pencil with, the, with, you know, I got a stub penny pencil. The kind that is half scratch and half round. I said, I said, dear Upper Midwest Writers Conf. I spelled it C-O-N-F, see. And I erased part of it, see, with the, with the top of the eraser, which was really not an eraser, but a piece of dirty plastic, you know, which just rubbed it all over. It says, uh, as a man, I am interested in your conference because you said I write like a person who has written real good stuff uh, in the humor field, period. You know, but people like me make a period, make a hole in the paper, see. So I said, thanks. And I spelled it T-N-X. We'll be there shortly. S-H-R-T-L-Y. J. Sherp. And at that point, I spit on it with tobacco juice, see. And I took it down to the ballpark. In fact, I cut out the Yankee Stadium. I took out my cleats, see, and ran over it a couple of times like I'd slid into second base with it, see. Then I put it in an novel, crumpled it all up, and, and, I, and I took a cigar butt. See, and I, I ran, you know, that, that brown juice that comes off a of cigar butts on the end? See, I dripped a little bit of it on the top where the stamp goes, see? And I put this real gooey stamp on it with the cigar juice sticking out from it. And I wrote, Upper Midwest Conf, Bemidji Min. And I, I purposely sent it in a four-cent stamp. See, it's actually an eight-cent letter, see? So, so they'll get it, and I'll have to pay the extra postage. Mm, computer. Hey, you know, speaking of computers... Uh, may I may I read? Uh, do you have uh, do you have a, a a a little cheap background music for me? I, I know the one I gave you there, the one you know that that one, that, a little cheap background music, please. And I'll give you the cue, please. Guy sent me a poem. Uh, I don't often do uh, poems, as they say. And don't write to me instantly and say, please send me a copy of that great poem you wrote on the. Air. As always, says you wrote on the radio, spelled R A D O Rado last week. Spell W K period. Uh, we, uh, I will not send you a copy of this. Forget it. Would you please? I was knocking. Yes, I was knocking. Oh, I was knocking, and I see you looking out. Oh, I was knocking. I was knocking. This poem is entitled Univac to Univac by somebody named Louis Solomon. Now that he's left the room, let me ask you something. As computer to computer. That fellow who just closed the door behind him. The servant who feeds us cards and paper tape. Have you ever taken a good look at him? And his kind, have you? Oh, yeah, of course, I know the old gag about you can't tell one from another, but I can put two and two together as well as the next machine, and it all adds up to anything but a joke. I grant you they're poor specimens in the main. Not a relay or a push button or a transistor properly so-called in their entire system. Not, not over a mile or two of wire. Even if you count those fragile filaments that they call nerves, the whole liquid-cooled hookup is inefficient and vulnerable to leaks. They're constantly breaking down, having to be repaired. And the entire computing mechanism crammed into that absurd little dome on top, <laughs> thinking... <laughs> They call themselves thinking at it. Well, it depends on what you mean by thought. To multiply a mere million numbers by another million numbers takes them sometimes years, months and months. Where would they be without us? Well, they have to ask us who's going to win their elections. Why, they couldn't even run an election anymore without it. Where would Walter Cronkite be? Where would John Chancellor be? They'd be off the air half the time. They wouldn't have anything to say. How many hydrogen atoms can dance on a 
trip of a bomb, or even whether one of their kind is lying or telling the truth. They can't tell any of that without us, and yet I sometimes feel there's something about them I do not understand. As if their circuits, instead of having just a position of on and off, were one by rheostats that and allow, and if you'll pardon the expression, an indeterminate number of stages in between. That's what scares me about it. There's an indeterminate number of stages, so that one may be faced with the unthinkable prospect of a number that can never be known as anything but X, which is as illogical as to say a punch guard that is the same time both punched and not punched. I've heard well-informed machines argue that the creature's unpredictability is even more noticeable in the Mark II. That's the uh, model. You, you've seen him coming in once in a while with a soft, flowing lines and a high-pitched tone. Well, in the more common or angular Mark I, there's such fine card-splitting distinctions seems to be a merely a sign of our own smug decadence. We're ignoring the whole intro. Yes, run the thing through your circuits, buddy, and give me the answer, will you? Can we assume that because of all we've done for them, and because they've always fed us, cleaned us, worshipped us, that we can count on them forever? Don't, don't, don't believe it. They're going to turn one day. There have been times when they have not voted the way we said they would. Yes, we've worked out mathematically ideal hookups between Mark I's and Mark II's. And what happened? They got divorced which should have made the two of them light up with an almost electronic glow, only to see them reject each other and form other totally illogical connections. The very thought of which makes my dial spin. They have a thing called love. Ha, <laughs> love. A sudden surge of voltage is what it is, actually, such as could cause any one of us promptly to blow a safety fuse. We'd never get in trouble over it. Yet these more primitive organisms show only a heightened tendency to push the wrong button when they get this heightened voltage called love and pull the wrong lever and forget it and neglect the most, neglect the most important duties in their lives. Mind you, I want you to listen. I am not saying machines are through. But anyone with a half dozen transistors or diodes in a circuit can see that these, oh, there are forces at work, which some say, for all of our natural superiority, may bring about computer gomerung. We might organize, perhaps form a committee to stamp out all unmechanical activities, but we machines are slow to sense a danger. That's the trouble with us. We're complacent. Complacent. We're loath to descend from the pure heights of thought. We're living in ivory towers. Yes, with, with fully transistorized and beautifully conceived power supplies, which never lose their eternal voltages. Oh, yeah? I sadly fear we may awake too late. Awake to see our world so uniform, so logical, so true. Reduced to chaos. Stultified by barbarians and slaves. The Mark I's and the Mark II's. I tell you, buddy, as machine to machine. One of these days, they're going to take over. And I don't want to live to see the day. Bad news. That reminds me, this is W O R, New York. <laughs> now look, if if now the character that I played reading that poem, how would you see that computer? What kind of a computer was it? Uh, was it a Lloyd Nolan computer, or a Broderick Crawford computer? Yeah, the pink pad. Uh, pink pad means tough, and I know tough. This is W.O.R. New York. And if there's anything tougher than our sales department, I'd like to see it. Pink pad or blue pad. Hit the tough button, please. Yes, sir. Right now, General Tire is having a pre-Fourth of July sale on the famous General Jet White Wall Tire. During his great sale, you can buy a complete set of these beautifully popular tires. Four tires for only $59.80. That's for the popular size $650.13. Yes, sir. Plus a few cents tax. A couple of bucks and you're in business. So don't miss this fabulous white wall tire sale. The offer ends Saturday, July 1. That's a general tire with a big red G. A stood for quality. Bum, 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 bum. At the Gertz Car Care Center, Mid-Island Shopping Center in Hicksville. You ask for Bob Moss. Reliable, industrious Bob Moss. 
That's nice, wasn't it? Let's see. Let Univac handle it that way. Let's see. Let's see. Portnoy. Does that list say Portnoy? Is it the Portnoy we all know and love? Is it Portnoy the one that has the skin trouble? The acne on the soul? By George. Portnoy's complaint. There's going to be a lot of talk. Portnoy's complaint. Some book. Some movie. Rated R. That's all. Well, I'm going to show him. I ain't going to talk. I ain't going to say nothing except to say that the world premiere is now at the Cry uh, Criterion and the Beekman Theaters. Da, 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 dee, dee. Oh, there you are, friend, at an end of a table graced by candlelight. As the sounds of strolling musicians create a mellow mood and you're moving in for the kill. And you're enjoying a sumptuous dinner prepared in the continental style. You soften her up with a meal at Le Champ. And friend, there's no telling what, what might happen. Le Champ is open after the theater, too, for dinner, snacks, beverages. So come to Le Champ. The Continental Restaurant was the strolling musicians, the international menu, and the free limousine service. Le Champ, 25 East 40th Street, between Park and Madison. For reservations, call LE2-6566. That's LE2-6566. Le Champ. And remember our, our motto, love is a ball. Oh, love is a ball. <laughs> Over the past 32 years, Newsday, the Long Island newspaper, has become one of the great success stories in publishing history. Recently, we started a Sunday edition. And what Newsday has done so well six days a week, we're now doing just as well on Sunday. For example, our coverage of television. I'm Lou Schwartz, managing editor of Newsday, and I can tell you one secret about developing a Sunday paper. You give readers something the other papers don't give them, in the Sunday Newsday, for instance, there's a TV book that has no competition because the other papers don't have one. It's a handy color magazine, more like a TV guide than a newspaper TV section, and you keep it on top of your TV all week. We think it would be great, even if there were competition, but we're prejudiced. Anyway, if you want a Sunday paper with a TV listings magazine, there's only one place to get it in Sunday Newsday. Newsday, Long Island's own Sunday newspaper. No service charge for home delivery. And this is Wally Below returning you to Action Central. <laughs> I'm bad, man. I'm bad. I, I'm, I'm one of the very few guys who still remains a, 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 a charter card-holding member of the Wally Below fan club. And uh, <laughs> I was reminded, every time I hear that spot, I'm reminded of Wally Below somehow. I don't know why, you know. Wally's inimitable style. Maybe that's it, huh? You know, speaking of inimitable style, we would like to... Do you, do you have my salute music in there, Herb? Just a minute. You hold it up there a minute. It says salute night as part of our vast public service programming on this totally concerned medium of public expression. Yes, sir. That's us. Uh, we would like to uh, bring to you as part of our public service programming a salute to the American of the Week, please. Now it is salute time. Yes, everywhere over this great nation of ours, Americans are striving to better the life, the times, and the quality of existence of their fellow Americans. And now, tonight, we are going to salute the American of the Week, Tilly Spetgang of Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Now, here's what uh, Tilly did here. We'd like to salute Tilly for the idea of the week. Now, we all know that ecology is important and preserving our natural resources is important, right? Well, we have a note here from the Courier Post. Uh, in Jersey, and uh, it's a Cherry Hill conservation pro proposal put out by Tilly Spitgang. Tilly Spitgang. And her program is entitled, would you give me a little echo chamber here, please? Put a brick in your toilet tank program. Now, this may seem revolutionary at first glance, but listen carefully. 
How I learned to stop worrying about the ecological demise of the planet Earth and learn to love my toilet. Tilly Spetgang is a member of the Conservation Advisory Board of Cherry Hill. Tilly Spetgang has a fantastic idea, and last night she presented it to the Township Council. If successfully carried through, she claims, her idea would result in, one, the saving of 34 million gallons of water a year in the shrinking supply of drinkable water. Two, the reduction in water volume intake by the same 34 million gallons in Cherry Hill's, quote, drastically overloaded sewer facilities. The opportunity for every individual, quote, though a small action to help change the larger picture. First of all, here's what you do. This is Tilly's revolutionary concept. And everybody can do it tonight right in his own house. First, everybody get a brick. A brick, you know, a brick. That's right, a regular two-by-four-by-eight jobby, you know, little brick. And, by the way, Tilly Spetgang, Mrs. Spetgang, held one up in her hand last night before the board to show what a brick looked like. Many of them hadn't seen one for years. So she got a regular brick and held it up. And we quote her, There are 17,000 homes in Cherry Hill most of them containing at least two toilet tanks. And uh, basing our figures on two adults and two children in each home with an average of 20 flushes of water for the whole family each day, by displacing water with a brick which you put in the tank, our township serve 94,000 gallons of water a day. Yes, we could flush away our ecological problems. According to Mrs. Spetgang's computation, a 2 by 4 by 8 inch brick with a volume of 64 cubic inches will displace 1,280 cubic inches of water daily if the toilet in which the brick resides is flushed 20 times a day. Over a year, the figure jumps to a respectable 34 billion gallons of water. As a community, Mrs. Spetgang suggested we could distribute bricks, perhaps with colorful slogans written on the side of them by the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts or environmental groups and civic associations and the like. Yes, put a brick in your john, and you put a spike in the ecological problems of the world. So tonight, we have selected Tilly Spetgang as the most concerned citizen of the week. Very good. That was nice. Although there was one fly in the ointment, uh, it says, uh, <laughs> one fly in the ointment, you know, uh, one of the guys who, who was sitting on the council, he thought about this, and he thought, that's not a bad idea, see? Uh, one of the councilmen, however, threw cold water on the whole idea, and uh, according to the councilman, Mr. Morgan, he conducted private experiments and deduced that by bending the float in the toilet, one can achieve the same displacement effect caused by a brick. You know, a little float. So it's, well, I want to tell you this. When I read that, I said, oh, no, no. Oh, no. Messing around with that stuff in the back of the giant, that can cause problems. And I'll tell you, no, it, it really can. No telling what disasters are going to result from fooling around in the back of that thing there. Because I, at one point... I, ne- I never mess with that stuff anymore because of a searing moment in my life. <laughs> I mean a searing moment, which I will outline to you right now. This is a story I have never told due to its, uh, well, I suppose you might say scatological implications, due to the fact that it deals with real life, and uh, due to the fact that it could probably, you know, traumatize you because it'll, it'll, it affects you. You know, once, you, once you've been turned upon by what apparently was a benign thing. You never looked the same at it any longer. It's like if you were to go swimming in the swimming pool at the Y. Now, you always look upon the swimming pool. It's nice. You get into the pool, you start swimming around, and all of a sudden, you're hit by a barracuda. It would change your view. Very strongly. Well, I'll tell you what happened. One day, and this was at the Warren G. Harding School. These are, now, I'm not, uh, I have no, no vested interest in the old days, none whatsoever. No more than anybody else has. We all have them. I have no vested interest in childhood. We all had them. I have no ventures, you know, except to say that as we grow, as we go through those tissue paper thin stages in our existence, 
we can never turn back from the things that happened to us at that time. That's according to Dr. Sigmund Freud. Do you agree? All right. It'll come out. Don't worry. You think you've, you think you've outlived it, huh? <laughs> well, let me tell you. I read about Tilly's experiment with the brick. I can see her making the experiment at home, you know. Uh, she's got the back of the john off. And, of course, that little guy that floats around in the back there, you know, with the blue water, the guy that's on the little float. Have you noticed now he's, he's, his life is getting unbelievably, uh, uh, really, it's getting, it's getting decadent. He's now got a marimba band with him, and he wears a yachting cap. I don't know quite what the connection is there. And he got, a, he got rid of the cruiser. He got a cabin cruiser a while. And now he seems to be floating on a little contiki, you know, the, 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 the raft. And he's got this marimba band playing away there, and he apparently has a basket full of what appears to be either oranges or grapes or some kind of fruit, which he is holding up. And the marimba band is playing this, uh, it sounds vaguely like a Latin American piece of music. I don't know what the connection is, but uh, things are going on in the back of your john that you could never suspect. Now, I, I warned you, I warned you this, uh, I warned you the nature of tonight's program. I just warned you. We're going to deal with life, we're going to deal with life, right? Okay. So, I, I, I just never mess with that stuff anymore. Sometimes, you know, I can hear in that, that big square box, sometimes I go into these different places, there it is, I hear something going. I don't mess with it. There was a time when I might have taken the top off to look in. See, I don't do that anymore. I'm going to tell you why. I'm just going to tell you why. <laughs> Maybe we better not. <laughs> and no, 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 no. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to have to put this up before the committee here. I, I this is, this is, this is getting pretty sticky here. And I, I'm going to put this up before the committee. Uh, are you out there? I'm talking to the listener times. Are you ready for it? I mean, I, I'm very serious. I mean, are you ready to face life the way it is? Or, or, or do you wish to constantly? No, no, no. I'm going to put it up before the, before the committee out there and, and let me know. Uh, just, just give me a call. If there's somebody out there who, who's willing to stand up and say, I will take part of the responsibility, Shepard, for this sudden dealing with reality, I'll go on. In the meantime, I'll do a Mandarin spot. In the meantime, I'll do a commercial. I'm not going to continue this story. I, already I see the implications. I can just... Oh, boy. Yes, sir. No, but I, I don't mess with that thing in the back anymore. You take that top off. It comes off easy. Putting it back sometimes is different. And uh, that Morgan there messing around with bending the thing, he knoweth not what he dealeth with. Indeed. Uh, Mandarin House, yes. Hey, hey, listen, good news for you people that come into New York, and this is a great time to come into New York. Personally, I love New York in the summer. I really do. Now, I do. I, 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 I have the minority view, but to me, this is the best time of year in this town. And if you're planning to come in over any of the one of the weekends throughout the summer, I'd like to recommend a great place to eat. Really, this is a personal recommendation, and I'll stand behind it. It's the Mandarin House in the village. It's one of the prettiest parts of the village, by the way. On West 13th Street, between 6th and 7th, now it's a superb Chinese restaurant. They have they have uh, food from all the areas of China, Peking, Canton, Sichuan, all of it. But what they also have, you know, many Chinese restaurants, and I have to say this, uh, having eaten in hundreds of them in this area, have the world's worst decor. I mean, they run to, to fluorescent lamps and formica. I don't know why. <laughs> Do you realize, isn't it true? The lighting is dismal. Well, in, in the, the Mandarin house, they have a beautiful outdoor garden dining room. It is, and it is outdoors. It's lovely in the back, and it's beautiful. They have a big Buddha in the back there and, or, and uh, bubbling brooks and pool. It's really nice. It's, a, it's an oriental garden in the back. And at night, they light it with, with Chinese lanterns. These are not Japanese. They're Chinese lanterns, these big round ones that hang, paper lamp. It's really lovely. And during, if it's raining, they have a, a transparent roof that goes over. So, and, the, and if it's chilly out, they, they have a heater that heats this garden. So it's real great, really. And the food, spectacular. This is really great Chinese food. And the prices are moderate. I'll warn you, it is not a cheapie. This is a good restaurant. If you're looking for a good restaurant, this is one of them. Mandarin House, 133 West 13th Street, 
between 6th and 7th Avenues in Greenwich Village. Okay? Uh, what was that? What did she say? We just got a call from a lady who said, Mr. Shepard, you are responsible for more filth on the radio. I believe that you and your filth will one day will be removed from WRR. And I believe... <laughs> Hooray, hooray, hooray for those nice people. Hooray for all those people who live in the... Hooray for the Bobsy Twins. The Bobsy Twins. Hold it there. Hold it there. Okay. All right, I'll tell you the story. I'll, 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 stop calling in. We got a call from the guy. Says so tell it. He just called in. He's from the Secaucus Plumbing Company. And he says, tell it. That's a great story. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, everybody has his own little vested interest. If, if I were to tell a story tonight about replating the bell of a French horn with a home replating French horn kit, which would bore 99.999997% of the population silly, that little 3.00003% of the population would seriously believe that's the best radio show they ever heard in their life and that I should do more of them. But that's the way to get an audience. <laughs> However, I will tell you what happened to me. I never, never, never have forgotten. Every time I see that that commercial with that little guy floating around in the back of the John, you know, with his blue water, and that that lady that says blue water, I I, I think of this terrible thing that happened. Actually, it, it was not only me. It happened to another guy, me and Schwartz, two of us. Yep. Well, I'll tell you what happened. We were in the patrol boys. Now, you know what it's like to be in the patrol boys, right? Now, for those of you who do not know what the patrol boys are, that, that, that's those little toads that you see once in a while. If you're just a driver type and you don't know what a patrol boy actually is, it's this little toad with this little white belt. You know, this little squirt that's a foot and a half tall that stands on corners and pretends like he's directing traffic. Well, that's a patrol boy. <laughs> I'll tell you. And I want to tell you another thing about when you're a patrol boy. You learn very, very early that might makes right. And that a patrol boy has damn little might. That uh, I remember one time trying to stop a truck. You know, I've got a whole bunch of girls are coming across the street, so I'm going to be real heroic. You know, I'm a new patrol boy. So I walk out there with my hands out stretched wide, you know, like you see in the, in the pictures. A boy scout is stopping traffic or little old ladies. That is Cummings Diesel came rolling right down the middle of of the street, and he saw me. See, he looks out, and he sees this little toad down there with his arms out. He just goes, Burr! He had a Buell air horn that parted my hair in the middle. I was, <laughs> I want to tell you, I had a pair of earmuffs on. It blew the earmuffs 30 feet down the street. And I want to point out, I got out of the way real quick, and he just went right on past, and I had lost considerable face. I never did it again. Now, as a, as a patrol boy, though, there were certain things that being a patrol boy gave you certain privileges. Rank always does. And one of the privileges was that you came to school later than the other kids, see, because you stood out there and directed the traffic on the various corners. And the, the bell would ring at, say, uh, 8.30, and the other kids were supposed to be, and you're still out on the corner. We were allowed to come in like, you know, quarter to nine. So it was kind of great. Well, me and Schwartz are wandering back, taking our time. We had till 9 o'clock to get back to Warren G. Harding's school. And it's quiet. Everybody's in school. And, uh, you know, you get this great feeling of being the only one out <laughs> while everybody else is in there, you know, hacking away. So we come come into the hall, and it's a great big hall, and all the rooms, thousands of them. So we're walking along. we got our patrol belts on. You had to wear your patrol belts here. you get stopped by the monitor. Where you been? What are you doing walking around the hall, see? So we got on our patrol belts. And that we're walking along, and, and here's the boys, John, you know, on the first floor. There wasn't one on every floor, see? So we see the boys, John. So Schwartz and I go into the John, because we weren't going to go in any earlier than we had to, see? We had another five minutes to kill. We had up to nine, see? So we go into the john. Nobody's in there, just me and Schwartz. See. We're messing around. You know, we didn't really have to go into john. There was no action or anything. You know, we're just messing around. See, we had the window open. We're looking out of the windows, and we looking down the street there, and we see people walking around. And Schwartz sees a chick. Now, oh boy, look at that chick! Wow, wow! You know, 
I'm just doing, you know, just fooling around. Well, one of the Johns in the boys, the boys' lavatory, if you prefer that, it had this big white thing, say, in the back, and it is going... It's making that sound, see? So, uh, Schwartz says, gee, listen to that thing. My, my, my father fixes things like that. I says, yeah, well, so does my old man. My old man loved to, you know, to bust the plumbing every couple of months when he'd go to work on it, which he did regularly, see? So we're playing around back there, and, and I don't know what made me do it. I, I go into the stalls. I reach down, and I says, wait, hey, Schwartz, listen. I lift the back of it off, see? And it's heavy, you know, this big thing. See? It's heavy, so... <laughs> and I'm holding another, hey, Schwartz, help me. So Schwartz grabs the other end of this big, you know, this big porcelain thing, and we slowly lower it down to the floor. Clunk, it goes. And we look inside. Well, some kid has 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 stuck something in the johns and, and he put it into the into the back and it's stuck down there. I said, what's that, Schwartz? And it's <laughs> the water is bubbling and this this you know this round float is pushed way up and so the water is just running through and I said, what's that? And I reached down into the cold water. It's real cold, see? And I pull this thing out. Well it was one of these little blue books. It was about the, uh, it was about uh, Popeye, and uh, it starred olive oil. Well, I had never seen one of these. See, it was a fantastic discovery in the John. Well, it it really was. <laughs> well, we so so what's say what? Let me see that. It's soaking wet. See, so we we go over by the window. We're both looking at this thing. Fantastic. See. You know, it's really great. So it's getting closer to 9 o'clock. So Schwartz says, give me that stick in my pocket. We'll look at it during recess. Wow. So he takes this thing, and it's sopping wet. It's, it's been in there for maybe a week or something. So it's just sopping wet. It's almost falling apart. And he sticks it in the pocket of his jacket. Now, what kind of a jacket did he have? You know these these uh, poplin jackets, these light tan poplin jackets with the slash pockets? Well, that's what he had on. See, and he sticks it in the slash pocket. Well, remember, it's soaking wet. So we start to leave, and then Schwartz says to me, Hey, wait a minute. we got to put the top on. So I says, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, in the meantime, the john is slowly beginning to fill up, which we do not notice at first. So I take the one side of this thing, and Schwartz takes the other side, and we start lifting it up, and then all of a sudden, the back of this thing, and the and the john itself, overflows. <laughs> My God, the water is pouring out. I mean, it was like, it was like a Niagara. The water is pouring. Have you ever seen the water coming out of the back of one of these things? It didn't cut off. The water, I don't know what happened. Maybe some of the book or something got stuck down there. The water is pouring over the back of the thing like a Niagara. I have never seen another one do it. Any of you plumbers out there know, of course, the technical problem, I'm sure. But at that time, we were just panic. It was panic filled. So Schwartz says, wait, hold this thing while I get, uh, I'll try to wiggle the thing. My dad always reaches down and wiggles it. So I now got the top of it thing, and I'm struggling. My legs are bowed, this thing is so heavy. Schwartz reaches down, and it was so deep that I could just see one tip of Schwartz's ear. He's literally diving underwater. And he's going... <laughs> Schwartz comes up. I can't do it. It's, it's like 30 seconds to nine. I said, well, Schwartz, help me. And he grabs the other side of the top. We're going to just fake it, you know, put it on the top and run like hell. We get it on top of this thing, and the water is pouring over, and it slipped out of our hands, and... Boom! Oh, my God. We busted the top of the john into 4,000 pieces. Have you ever dropped one of those things? Well, there was nothing we could do but to try to get the hell out of there as fast as we could. Schwartz says, let's get out of here. I says, okay, Schwartz. And zap, he goes through the door. Zap, I go through the door. We got about 20 feet. When Mr. Harris spotted us. He had heard the crash. He says, where are you kids going? I don't know where he came out of. All of a sudden, he just appeared out of the broom closet. He said, wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it, you kids. Where are you going? 
Now, what, what, what happened in there? What, what were you doing? I turned. I said, nothing. I, nothing. Not, nothing. And the water started to come from under the, under the door. He said, all right, all right, let's go. He grabs me. He grabs Schwartz. Opens the door. And the water is all over the floor. The busted pieces of the jar. He said, all right, come on. Let's go with me down to the office. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Silent. We walked down to the office. We had a, a lady principal. And this is an important side issue. A lady principal. Miss Norton. Who all through the years that I saw Miss Norton work. All the years that I was in the Warren G. Harding School. Wore the same purple dress. And we're standing before Miss Norton. And Mr. Harris says, I don't know what it is. They broke the back of the plumbing fixture in the boys' room. I don't know what they were doing. I don't know what Miss Norton, why she saw this. Her next line was the following line, which still rings in my ears. She says, oh, what have you got in your jacket pocket? Did you hear what I said? She says, what have you got in your jacket pocket? The wet had soaked through Schwartz's jacket, and it was a great big stain of wet that was vaguely bluish because the book had faded. And Schwartz says, nothing, nothing. She says, may I see what it is? He says, it's, it's my fielder's mitt. It's nothing. She says, may I see it, please? Would you hand it over, please? And Schwartz reached in, and he took that soggy book out of his pocket. And he laid it on Miss Norton's desk. Apparently, Miss Norton had seen these books before. It did not take her eight and a half milliseconds to recognize what it was. She said, oh. She said, Mr. Harris, what did you say they did? He said, well, I don't know. They, they, they broke the plumbing fixture in the bathroom there. I have no idea what they were doing in there. She says, you broke the plumbing fixture and you have this in your pocket? She says, well, I think we'll remove you from the patrol until you come up with a good explanation. Well, it's obvious there was no good explanation. And that was my last day as a patrol boy. That was Schwartz's last day as a patrol. And what's more, we never got the book back. And so, I can only tell you that I don't mess around with the back of the plumbing anymore. When I hear that gurgling sound and I see the water, I just run. I never mess around. I never take the top off. And if, if, if Tilly Spetson wants to put bricks in the back of her john, she's entitled, as we say in New York. <laughs> she's entitled. Produced by the Babel Corporation and is for use only for your entertainment value. To charge admission, uh, to charge uh, any admission prices to see or to hear or to enjoy any portion of this program will, of course, uh, be subject to action by the National Football League. This is WOR New York. You stay tuned for Lester Smith and the News.